Call it that old adage at Grandpa's house, anything goes just about. I mean, when they come there, we're not going to say you got to eat your vegetables. We say, here's some french fries. <laughs> uh, we don't say you need to watch those calories. We say, here's some cookies. Yeah, we do that. We do our, our bit of spoiling, but we're also doing our bit of training. And Ms. Haddles is learning what it means to get corrected now. In fact, last night, uh, there was a fan sitting in front of me, and we had it off because it's cold, and she came over and turned it on. I said, Haddles, don't do that. She just looked at me. She understands now that it's not like she doesn't know. She just looked at me. I said, don't do that. And I reached over and turned it off. She was looking at me, and she went up and she turned it on. <laughs> She looked at it a couple times and she looked back at me and then she looked at me and she went. And that time when she went up, I went, I said, don't do that. She backed away. And the rest of the night, she wouldn't even get close to the fan. <laughs> she walked over there, she kind of looked at me and she'd look at me and then she'd keep going. <laughs> but there's more than that we've got to do as grandparents. So I've started ordering books. Christian books for them and things like that. Because we've got a job to raise up this next generation, both as parents and grandparents. Because I can tell you this, the culture is going to influence them whether we do or not. For example, public education. Public education today is ruled by a worldview of secularism. It's, it, across the board, has adopted a Darwinian view of life. So, understanding that, one of the first things I have to do is do away with my memories of what public education used to be when I was there. Because when I went to Headland, we learned nothing about Darwin. Or if, if Darwin was mentioned, it was just a quick and, and skip over. Now, they're indoctrinated in the world. I mean, back, back in the day, back in the good old days, uh, they didn't put up with foolishness. I mean, I, I made more than one trip to see the prince. It never was a good trip. Our, our uh, principal, I remember in middle school, Mr. Frank. I'm sure he's dead and gone now, but because he was old then. But he had a paddle he had used for years, and it looked like a ball bat <laughs> that he had just cut down the middle and it drilled holes in it because the belief was that there was holes in it, it would steam more. And boy, when Mr. Franklin, he might have been old, but he still had some strength. <laughs> And he'd crank that arm up, and then he'd go up a couple more notches to get a little bit more on it. And then he would lift you up. And you'd be singing the high praises for a while. <laughs> and that was just for doing stuff that today they wouldn't even raise an eyebrow. I remember one time I was in PE class, and we had an old mean coach then. I don't remember his name. I tried to forget him. And a group of us boys were just standing there, and I don't even know what we were doing. But he just came through there, whacking everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I still don't know what we did. <laughs> but I got whacked. <laughs> I have to remind myself, that's gone. They don't start school off anymore with the Pledge of Allegiance and the Lord's Prayer, citing the 23rd Street. In fact, one lady told me of her experience with her child, because her daughter kept getting beat up by a group of lesbians in the middle school. <coughs> she 
because you wouldn't respond to their advances. We didn't have none of that when I was in school. So you can't rely on education. They will influence, by the way. When you, they have your kids eight hours a day and you see them for one or two, guess who went All right, number two, media. Media is a big thing now, including social media. And in media, what does media uh, convey? Hedonism. Hedonism means it feels good to do it. And so if you watch anything in media, unless you're like us and watch the old stuff, all we watch anymore just about is Me TV. Andy Griffith, Roma Pyle, that, that's about it. But the newer stuff, you can't even get through a commercial without profanity all the way through. Yes, the same is true. And there is nothing virtuous in any of it. They just compete to see who can go the lowest. So it teaches hedonism. Uh, the influence of peers. Most of the peers of our children or grandchildren, now there's exceptions like in the homeschool group, this may not be true. But if they go to school, most of their peers are influenced by postmodernism, which means I have your my truth, you have your truth, we're both right. Even if we contradict each other, that's okay too. Well, what's been the result of that? This isn't a new problem. In fact, uh, I heard this morning of one guy who tracks his stuff, says it takes about 20 or 30 years to throw to totally flip a generation from its worldview to another worldview. Well, so we're kind of there. In fact, we know, based on the research, over half of young adults today who were raised in church leave. Now, don't think it's like the old days when it used to be, you know, kid raised in church, Johnny goes off to college, leaves the church, lives, sows his wild oats, and then he finally settles down, gets married, they have kids, and they come back to church so they can put their kids through the same routine. That's over. These people that they surveyed aren't coming back. Now, why is that happening? Well, uh, they had four reasons. One, their families did not have a strong tie to church. Kind of go where they want to. Number two, they married someone who was not religious or practices another religion. Number three, they bought into the idea that morality should be free of religion. Number four, they believe the Darwinian and secular view of life and history and religion has no place in that world. So, I know people walk away. We've known people who walk away. But I believe that if they really know the Lord, if the Holy Spirit really is indwelling them, that someone may walk away from God for a while because they're offended or whatever, but they're not going to stay away. Because God's going to always be drawing them back to himself. And then you may ask, well, what about so-and-so? They walked away and they never came back. Well, you know what? It could just be they didn't come back because they were never there. They're lost. Ba, 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 ba. Don't, don't crank up the motorboat on them. There's a lot of people walking around today who think they're safe because they walked the aisle, they got baptized, they said a prayer, they, they went to church, they joined the church, and they're as lost as anyone else. They just may be good people lost. They may be moral people lost, but they're lost. That's the truth. Number two, the second reason why some people may be slow to come back, and this may be people who do know the Lord, but you know, God could be drawing somebody back to himself, and we can mess that up. You know that? Y'all look at me like, you know what I'm talking about? We can mess that up. God can be drawing somebody back, and maybe they need to, they know that we're Christians, so they're kind of watching us to see, well, I don't know, I'm, I, I've 
feel like I'm being drawn back, but I'm not really sure this is real. So and so's a friend. I just kind of watch him a few days and see what happens. And then we just get out there and act like pure infidels. Well, let me encourage us today with, with what we can do to bring them back. Number one, what can we do not only to bring back those who are away from God, but also what can we do to help lead those who don't know God to faith in Christ? And what can we do to, to provide an example in this culture of what true Christianity looks like? Number one, pray. Pray. Pray to be in sync with God. Pray for divine intervention. Pray for those who are enemies of Christ that they will be saved. That Capitol Hill's prayer partners uh, thing I mentioned this morning, they listed seven things we should pray for. Number one, pray for the unity of the nation on the foundation of truth. Number two, pray the Lord will confuse and confound the plans of those who operate counter to the truth. Number three, pray that Christians through the church will be the light of the world in this dark and difficult time. Number four, pray that federal officials will yield to the truth that the authority of, of that the authority and limit, limitations of the Constitution apply to our government. Pray, uh, number five, pray the authorities will review the state election systems and expose corruption. Six, pray that God's people will stand firm in the power of God's mind. Number seven, pray that God's people will demonstrate the love of Christ to others. So the number one thing we can do in response to all this changing is to pray. Not only pray for ourselves that we'll be in sync with what God is doing and what God is saying because if we're not, we're going to be saying things that are irrelevant to the time. I had somebody uh, uh, contact me this morning and was asking me, what's your opinion about such and such? such? I said, well, my opinion is right now, we need to be in sync with what the Spirit's saying. And if your pastor's not in the sync <laughs> with what the Spirit's saying, you need to get under one who is. Because right now, the Spirit isn't telling us 10 ways to be happy, five ways to be successful, four ways to have a happy marriage, three ways to get out of life all that we want, <laughs> two ways to make God do what you want him to do, uh, or any of that. That's completely out of sync with what God's saying. So we need to say what God's saying, but we got to pray so that we can be in sync with that. Number two, we obey the guidance of the Spirit. That's another way we're going to make a difference in this culture, is if we're led by the Spirit. Um, number three, stay. So we've got pray, obey, stay. Stay means do not move from or compromise the truth. Do not move from or compromise the truth. And number four, display. That means to illustrate the superior life that God made ava available through Christ. Now, you say, boy, that's a lot. Well, this is serious times. These are serious times. And I don't know about you, I got too much at stake to just sit back and go with what? We have got to make a difference for the kingdom. We have got to represent the kingdom of heaven in a way that people see that what we have is not only real, but superior to what they have. Because I'm telling you, when folks go into this secular, secularist view of life, eventually it dawns on them, this goes nowhere. This ends nowhere. But it's going to take people of courage to do this. 
know, tomorrow is the celebration of Martin Luther King's birthday. And I found a good quote by him that I think applies here. He said, the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands in times of challenge and controversy. You see, we got too much at stake to play church, to go along with the cultural church, or to pretend it's business as usual. It's not. Now the good news is the Bible tells us what to do if we want to be people who make a difference. The question is, will we do it? Last night uh, in the youth Sunday school, we looked at we're looking at 2 Timothy right now. And we looked at the verse where Paul tells Timothy, this is how I want you to approach people who are opponents of the faith. And what he said to do was to approach them gently and with patience. So that perhaps God will grant them What's the point? The point I shared with them this morning, I'll share with all of you. Our job is not the results. Our job is the presentation of the truth. Last night, I was just kind of scrolling along with Facebook, and um, something popped up, some Christian group put up about. Um, should the church recognize same-sex marriages? And I've seen it before, so they were just repeating, or somebody was just repeating old stuff. Anyway, I always get more fun out of reading the comments than reading actual stuff. So I was just kind of scrolling through the comments, and, <clears throat> and right in the middle of a bunch of comments of no, no way, you know, they're all going to hell and all this other kind of stuff. Uh, two guys jumped in there and said, basically agreed on the statement, well, we're glad that Christians have finally started interpreting the Bible correctly and accepting same-sex marriage. I couldn't let that go. <laughs> <laughs> now, in my response to this guy, I don't know, but in my response to this guy, I didn't you infidel, you're going to bust the old wide open. You're, I, no. I said, well, no, uh, that's not true. I said, what you're saying is two, over 2,000 years of biblical interpretation has been wrong until now. And he responded, it hasn't been 2,000 years since the King James Bible was published. <laughs> I said, well, if you really care about it, I'll, I always put that in. If you really care about this, and not just trying to get off something going, check out the ESV or the New American Standard because they're based on the earliest manuscripts out there. And you will find the message is the same. And then I gave them a little Bible lesson on why the Bible says that. Now, I didn't say, now you better repent or else. I didn't curse him. What was all those curses? Bad love, bad hell, <laughs> person with poverty, and I didn't do any of that. Good. I just presented the truth to him in a way that was with gentleness and patience. He never responded. But you see, there's going to be a lot of folks like that who have been told just enough Bible stuff, most of it wrong, that they've been told enough to be confused. And God's going to see to it that some of those folks cross our path. 
when they do, let me encourage all of us to be living in a way that's consistent with the message we claim to represent. Now, I'm not so much here talking about I don't drink, smoke, and chew with humble folks who do it. There are health nuts that do that, that don't know the Lord. Okay, so that's not the measure of things. The measure of things is people see something in us or by being around us, they can't explain that it touches them or changes them in some way. One of the greatest compliments I've had recently in working with folks through Angel House who are going through trauma, who are grief, and all this other stuff, one of the greatest compliments I can ever get from any of those clients is this. I feel peaceful. You know why they feel peaceful now? Because I'm peaceful. You know why I'm peaceful? Because the Holy Spirit's peaceful. And I'm just letting him do his thing. So think about your own situation and the people who get around you. What is it they walk away with after being around you? Boy, that guy's mean as the <laughs> Or do they walk away with, I don't understand it, but when I'm with so-and-so, I just feel fill in the blank. I tell you what, to be in the blank is one of those fruits of the Spirit. More life. And it may not be peace, it may be love. It may be joy. I, I, you know, all of us knew Robert Smith knew that was his thing. You could be the, the lowest of low and get around Robert Smith for just a few minutes and you were laughing and, and your mood had lifted because this guy, he just spread joy everywhere he went. And no, he did not live a charmed life. Is filled with the Spirit. We've got to be people who can say to this culture, as it all falls apart, and it will, here's the way of it. But we have to live it first. You can't just hit people with the gospel and then say, well, I never knew you were a Christian. Close with a quote from one of my favorites, Francis Schaeffer. Reformation is a return to the sound doctrine of the Bible. Revival is the practice of that sound doctrine under the power of the Holy Spirit. So, Father, I pray for us today. Lord, I know our initial reaction to things is to do as uh, that pastor did and just bring curses down on everybody. But Father, I know that that might be a reaction, but that's not necessarily the one that you want. The one that you want is for us to illustrate, to model the Christian life. And what it really is, and not what our culture says it is. So help us, Lord, to remember to pray. Help us, Lord, to obey as the Spirit guides us. Help us to stay and be firmly planted in sound doctrine on the truth, uncompromising, even when the truth is in. Help us to display and to model what it means to be a believer. To be someone who's inhabited by the Spirit of God. So Lord, I thank you that you have, have brought us to this place now where it's time to put up or shut up. And so Lord, may we not squander this opportunity. Do thank you, Lord, for the
President Trump. And I thank you, Father, that under him you gave the church a four-year reprieve. We can't forget what was happening, the pressure that was building against the church under the previous administration. We thank you for that four-year reprieve. That four years of what was supposed to be preparation and training. And now in four years it ended. And the marathon began. I pray, Lord, that we won't lose heart. I pray we won't grow weary. But, but that we will run the race you set before us. In Jesus' name. And Lord, I pray you bless on each person that's here today. And I do want to pray for those of our family who are sick. Lord, we especially want to pray for Sue going through uh, COVID and, and hopefully recovering from it. And Lord, we pray for Beth that she will continue to bring healing in her body as well. Amen. And Lord, I, I just thank you that if you are on the throne, that you haven't given it up, you're not going to give it up. And so Lord, like, like we saw last week with Isaiah, help us to see your glory filled us to see that you're still in control. Lord, help us to be those who will go forth and spread the good news. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for being here today. Hope to see you next week. Stay safe.